and to rejoice and log in, and to rejoice and log in. Today will be a joyful day, and to rejoice and log in. The flaming chalice is the symbol of our Unitarian Universalist faith. It's time now to light our chalice. So if you have a chalice or a candle at home, please grab it now and let's say together the words that we say each week at our fellowship. We light this flame as a symbol of new life enlightening our way, okay. as a symbol of the warmth in every human heart. Let, Let the, the lighting, lighting of this flame rekindle in us the inner light of hope, of peace, of love. May we share that light with all people. Good morning. I am Marie Luna, your Director of Congregational Life. Thank you for welcoming us into your home today. It is good to be together, even when we have to be physically apart. If you are joining us from another Unitarian Universalist congregation, welcome. If this is your first time visiting the fellowship, I want to extend you a special welcome. I encourage you to reach out to us to find out more about our fellowship. I'm happy to help you get connected here. I'll put my email address in the chat box and it's on the screen. I hope that you'll reach out. I will also be leading a special breakout session for newcomers today during the time when everyone else goes to their breakouts. I will put the Zoom link in the chat box now and at the end of the service. I hope you'll join me. Today's service is being led and supported by Reverend Christina Leon Tracy, our senior minister, Reverend Leah Angiri, our associate minister, Ali Peters, our intern minister, David Velguth, our lay worship leader, Kim Hartman, our Director of Religious Education, Steve Seek, our Music Director, and our wonderful musicians and singers, and Adam Robinson, our AV Tech. Thank you to everyone who has made this morning's service possible. This year, we are focusing on growing resilience. We're digging in to what it means to grow ourselves and our community to be sources of life even when things get tough. Right now, we are in our theme focusing on flexibility. Thank you for joining us as we remember the power of change, growth, and bending under pressure. We are so glad you're here. I invite you to settle into your space wherever you are, setting aside your week in whatever way you're able so that we can be together fully, even from afar. Good morning. It's time for the Wonder Box. We use the symbol of the Wonder Box to remind us that wondering is an important skill for Unitarian Universalists. It allows us to keep our minds open throughout our whole lives and to always search for truth and meaning and what that means to each of us. So I'm wondering if anyone has a guess about what they think is inside. If you do, go ahead and type it into the chat box and we'll all enjoy uh, looking at what other people think is in here. So it's been snowy this week. It's been cold. I'm thinking, you know, parka maybe or a shovel. Okay. Let's see what's really in here. 
Oh, it is a clamshell. Hmm. All right, well, that reminds me of a poem. And the poem is called The Jellyfish and the Clam. Said the clam to the pink jellyfish, You're no more than a lump of wet squish. You've no backbone or brain. You're too dull to explain. When they look at you, people go, Ish. Said the jellyfish back to the clam, I may look like thin raspberry jam, but you're just a thick shell and you don't even gel. So I'm happy to be what I am. Well, I say, let's give three big cheers for those two and their lengthy careers. Though they both may be dull, with no spine and no skull, still they've lasted a half billion years. So we just learned that clams have been around for a really long time. They've been able to continue to exist since prehistoric times because long ago they learned to adapt by developing a shell. And the shell protects their soft bodies from being crushed, and it also helps to protect them from predators. Now, jellyfish are also soft and squishy, but they do not have a shell at all. A jellyfish would never be able to have a shell like a clam because it breathes through its skin. So if there was a shell there, it wouldn't be able to breathe. And also, a jellyfish is almost transparent because this helps it to hide from its predators. They can't really see it. So both creatures have lived in the same watery environment for about the same amount of time, but they have each adapted very differently and both have been successful in surviving. Now, in our poem, we learned that both species have been around for a half a billion years. And I know that that's a really long time, but I don't really know if I understand what that means. So let's think about it this way. If we were to try to count to half a billion, the age of clams and jellyfish, and each number that we count represents one year how long do we think it would take? So let's just do a little experiment right now. Let's count to 10. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Easy. If we did that 10 times, then we would count to 100. And so to count to 1,000 like that would take about 10 minutes. So let's just stop here for a minute to talk about humans. Most scientists think that people who look like us, modern Homo sapiens, have been here for about 130,000 years. So to count to how long ago humans arrived, it would take about 47 hours to count to 130,000. That's almost two straight days with no stopping, not even for sleeping, straight through. Okay, now let's go back to our clams and our jellyfish. How long to count to a million now? So somebody actually did this. It was a man named Jeremy Harper. And he counted all day and night, except for he did sleep. And it took him 89 days, so almost a whole summer vacation, to count to one million. But remember, clams and jellyfish have been here for about a half a billion years. So if he were to have kept going to a half a billion, it would have taken him, or it would take us, about 15 and a half years. That's a really long time. And it's a really, really long time to live as successfully as clams and jellyfish. So from the 47 hours, the time that it takes to count how many years humans have been here, to 15 and a half years, the amount of time it takes to count how many years jellyfish and clams have been here, I'd say that jellyfish and clams are doing pretty good.
we might have something to learn from them. So as we listen to the rest of this service and we begin our new week, let's remember what we can learn from some of our oldest cold beings, the clam and the jellyfish, whether living in an ocean or living during a pandemic. The key to success comes in part from the ancient gift of the ability to adapt. This morning's first reading is by John Gibbons. It is an excerpt of an essay he wrote in the book, The Whole World Kin, which explores evolution and spirituality. Ernst Mayer, when asked what delayed the acceptance of evolution by natural selection, cited Western Platonic philosophy, the idea that there are ideal types or kinds of organisms. The quintessential perfect rabbit, woodpecker, butterfly, white-handed gibbon monkey, or human being. In his work, Mayer reminded us, like birds and flowers and all living things, we are each unique individuals, constituents of a multifaceted population. Mayer advised that we must adopt population thinking. That is, we are a population of diverse individuals. In any biopopulation, no two individuals, not even identical twins, are actually identical. There is no such thing as the perfect ideal. The failure to adopt population thinking is the primary source of racism, sexism, heterosexism, ableism, ageism, or anyism. And we must not forget the evil of the Holocaust, fueled by illusion of an Aryan idea, the evil opposite of population thinking, and after all, fueled by theories founded on Darwin's work. How often, among ourselves, with our children, neighbors, strangers, and friends, we are tempted to categorize people or urge others to fit some mold of our own making. Darwin and liberal religion say we are individuals living or trying to live amidst a population. Darwinism, Gibbons concludes, also disabuses us of the illusion that there is anything alive, that this unchanging, not a tree, nor a human being, nor any biopopulation, such as church, for example. He quotes Edwin Muir, the way leads on. None stays here. None. And what will come at last? The way leads on. Inside your souls, the kindling of the hearth, fire pilgrims new, find the spirit. 
which always restless find it in each mind and heart touch and hold that ancient yearning kindling for a newfound truth this morning's second reading is a poem by Stephen Dunn entitled At the Smithville Methodist Church. It was supposed to be arts and crafts for a week, but when she came home with the Jesus Saves button, we knew what art was up, what ancient craft. She liked her little friends, she liked the songs that they sang when they weren't twisting and folding paper into dolls. What could be so bad? Jesus had been a good man, and putting faith in good men was what we had to do to stay this side of cynicism, that other sadness. Okay, we said, one week. But when she came home singing, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so, it was time to talk. Could we say, Jesus doesn't love you? Could I tell her that the Bible is a great book that some people use to make you feel bad? We sent her back without a word. It had been so long since we believed, so long since we needed Jesus as our nemesis and friend, that we thought he was sufficiently dead, that our children would think of him like Lincoln or Thomas Jefferson, Soon it became clear to us, you can't teach disbelief to a child. Only wonderful stories, and we hadn't a story nearly as good. On parents' night, there were the arts and crafts all spread out like appetizers. Then we took our seats in the church, and the children sang a song about the ark and hallelujah, and one in which they had to jump up and down for Jesus. Evolution is magical, but devoid of heroes. You can't say to your child, evolution loves you. The story stinks of extinction and nothing exciting happens for centuries. I didn't have a wonderful story for my child. And she was beaming. All the way home in the car, she sang the songs, occasionally standing up for Jesus. There was nothing to do but drive, write it out and sing along in silence. Good morning, everybody. I'm David Velguth, your lay worship leader this morning. And this week's topic is to talk about survival and uh, how we've had to adapt to continue to survive. And I've talked about some challenges I've had in the past and um, overcoming a few, but I wanted to talk a little bit about, about what I've had to do to adapt to you know, survive and be productive in today's society. And one of those things is learning how to adapt by not walking. Thankfully, there are uh, companies out there dedicated to help you regain as much mobility 
as you can. For example, I can drive. Even though I don't have any use of my legs, I can still transfer into a driver's seat, pull up under the steering wheel, and drive a car using hand controls. It's one of the most freedom-feeling things that I can do with nobody else's help. Just go on the open road, and because others have learned to adapt vehicles, people like myself have that capability still. And um, it really is a uh, spiritual thing every time I go on the road, which is pretty much every day. Another thing I've learned to adapt to was not being able to play sports like I used to. Um, instead, I adapted to some things that I could still do. Uh, picked up the, the sport of table tennis. A lot of you know it as ping pong, but there was a coach in college who told me, you could still do this, Dave. And um, sure enough, I uh, taped a paddle to my to my hand and um, ended up winning a tournament at the uh, school commons and, and getting to travel a little bit to uh, compete against some other schools. So again, adapted a sport, used to be tennis, started playing it on a table and still got to feel what the thrill of competition was all about. I also learned how to live my competition through my uh, daughter's eyes. I started her in softball at a young age and got to watch her progress and compete all the way through high school. And that was a thrill for me to see her play and succeed um, as I used to at a youngster. Another thing that I've had to adapt to is uh, learning how to smile. When you're in sales, when you're in a leadership position, you're on TV, actor, actress, you're going to see them smiling. And that is not an easy thing to do. I've had to adapt to putting a smile on my face. In sales, if you approach somebody, they're already going to say, I'm just looking, I don't need any help. If you approach them with a uh, stolen face. Need any help today? If you approach them with a friendly face on, you're much more likely to get in with that customer and have them start talking to you instead of putting up a barrier or a wall. Reverend Christina, Reverend Leah, you'll see them offering a smiling face as you come into the sanctuary, when they're preaching on Zoom here with us, again, it's much more attractive to watch and pay attention to people who have a smile on their face. It's not easy to do. Try it. Put a smile on your face, even though you might not even be happy right now. Is it? Okay. If you do that, you're going to find that people are going to be more attracted to you more likely to talk to you, and you're going to be more likely uh, to get what you're going after. Give it a try and see how it works for you. Thank you. Many of you know that I am the mother of two children. Our older son just turned five, and our younger will be two at the end of this month. One of the things that I vastly underestimated about having a four-year-old during a pandemic was how much I would learn about dinosaurs. There are so many of them. Way more dinosaurs than when I was a kid because new species are being discovered all the time and existing species are constantly being revised. Like now we know that the famous Tyrannosaurus rex had feathers. This graph, which is just a joke, but it's exceedingly accurate. It shows the knowledge of dinosaurs according to age over time. It says that you know a lot when you get that double PhD in paleontology, but even more when you are four years old 
or are the parent of a four-year-old. Now, this sermon is not about dinosaurs, but it is about evolution. Next week would have been Charles Darwin's 212th birthday. And so in the spirit of our theme of resilience and flexibility, we are celebrating Darwin and evolution today. As Unitarian Universalists, we turn to multiple sources of inspiration. Our tradition currently names six primary sources, and number five on that list is humanist teachings, which counsel us to heed the guidance of reason and the results of science and warn us against idolatries of the mind and spirit. And this means that we look to science, not just for facts, but also for spiritual inspiration to help us find meaning and value in life, just like we might look to personal experiences, religious scriptures, or the natural world for inspiration. And that is what I hope we do today. Find some spiritual, meaningful inspiration from science and evolution and Darwin. But back to dinosaurs for a moment. The other night I was reading to my son about the Stegosaurus, you know, the dinosaur with the big diamond shaped plates on its back. And as I was droning on and on with the facts that he adores, I saw that the Stegosaurus lived during the Jurassic period between 155 and 150 million years ago. Whoa, I said. What? My kid asked. That species of dinosaur existed for five million years. That's a really long time. So we then flipped through the book and saw that other species existed for even longer. The gigantic crocodile species Dinosuchus existed for 11 million years. As we learned in our Wonder Box, clams and jellyfish have existed for about 400 million years. 400 million! Humans, on the other hand, at least those who have used language or tools, humans have probably only existed for about one third of one million years. And early agriculture was only about 12 to 15,000 years ago. It's humbling and awe-inspiring to consider the vastness of life on our planet. This historical record that dates back not only centuries, but many, many, many millions of years, and that we, this primate species with very few particularly useful evolutionary traits, except our big brains, we are a part of this incredible family tree of life. That we can count not only the chimpanzee as our cousin, but fish as our ancestors along with many, many aunts and uncles, grandparents, and siblings. Charles Darwin's theory of evolution was not the first time anyone had ever named evolution, but it was the first time that anyone had described the mechanism by which evolution might take place, how it works, natural selection. Natural selection, which was described in Darwin's first book on the origin of species, described the structure of the family tree that I just talked about, or as scientists call it, the phylogenetic tree. The idea that each species arose from the species before it, and that adaptation is what allows each species to branch off into something distinct. That was the amazing idea that Darwin named. Prior to Darwin, species were considered static, that they couldn't change. But often we now know that these adaptations, these changes arise 
because of changes in the environment. One of the most elegant examples of evolution by natural selection occurred in the peppered moth. A moth which is found in Europe and Asia and North America, it can be white or black or sometimes gray. The moth, which in these studies was studied in England, was historically around England white until the Industrial Revolution arrived and brought with it smog and soot coating the trees and other places where a moth might try to hide. Suddenly, being white was no longer an advantage and the moths with darker wings were more likely to survive being eaten by predators and pass on their genes to their offspring. Within a relatively short time, evolutionarily speaking, the whole population of peppered moths around England turned black. In the 20th century, when laws changed to improve pollution, scientists studied that the moth, these moths and observed that as early as the 2000s, the majority of that same population was returning to white to better blend in to the tree bark that was no longer coated in soot. The thing that is so fascinating about natural selection and these adaptations is that there's nothing inherently good or superior about white moths or black ones or webbed feet or fins or sharp teeth or blunt teeth or fur or feathers or scales or skin. There's nothing superior about any of them. What matters is only whether those features help the species to adapt and change along with the environment. I love that. It's so easy for us to want to give value judgments, but we don't have to. Is it adaptive? That's the question. In our reading that we heard earlier by John Gibbons, the one that Dave read for us, we heard the advice to adopt population thinking. The false idea that there's some ideal version of anything that we should all be striving toward or that we are striving toward has led to racism, sexism, and every other kind of ism that creates untrue and unethical hierarchies. Population thinking is the ability to view adaptation as a goal, not just for individuals, but for whole populations. And that surviving and thriving is not an individualistic effort, but one that we can do together. That we rise or fall as a species according to our collective ability to adapt. Gibbons concluded in that reading, quote, Darwinism also disabuses us of the illusion that there is anything alive that is unchanging. Not a tree, nor a human being, nor any bio population, such as a church, for example. End quote. There is hope. There is hope to be had in the miracle of collective adaptation. And while we humans often struggle in this way, we can and must continue to work together for the greater good of the whole, especially during this pandemic. While on the one hand, I can moan and rage at individuals who don't seem to be acting with the collective good in mind, on the other hand, I can also marvel at the way that groups and organizations, and businesses, communities have worked together and changed in incredibly rapid and ingenious ways to adapt to this crisis that we are all facing. From the creation of mutual aid websites for people to offer help and others to receive it, to the widespread sharing of stimulus checks, from those who didn't have much need for them to those who did, from the light speed move to Zoom and other online platforms across the world in all areas of business and social life, 
to the creative ways that restaurants have managed to serve via delivery and curbside pickup and outdoor bubble enclosures. In a Washington Post article by Elizabeth Heath in May 2020, last May, the article was entitled, Adaptability Might Be Your Most Essential Skill in the COVID-19 World. She writes, quote, accepting the uncertainty of the future means planning one step at a time, which is especially important when the landscape is changing so rapidly. We have to let go, she writes, of the need to plan from A to Z and learn to be okay with planning from A to B. After all, by the time we get to B, things already might have changed. Just ask anyone who postponed their March vacation to May. End quote. Or postponed till January for that matter, right? This is true of both individuals and populations as we consider the future. And evolution has a lot to say about not planning too far in advance. Species change gradually. And while we might have to change more quickly than the speed of natural selection, we know that changing or managing one thing at a time and not planning too far into the future is our best strategy right now. It's likely that that was probably always the best strategy, but COVID-19 has just made it really obvious. Now, this is hard for me both as an individual and as someone whose job it is to help our organization, our fellowship, thrive into the future, I like plans. I like to know where we're going. And right now, we just don't. At least not in the detailed sense. We don't know when or how we will reopen our physical building. We don't know when or how we will be able to gather in big groups or what that will look like over time. Being adaptable to the changes means holding our plans loosely and being willing to continue to pivot our plans again and again. But back to population thinking. There's nothing inherently good or superior about being a white moth or a black one. But the changing environment decides which wing color is more successful. It's very neutral. This same thing is true for us. Really, I know that we miss the before times. I miss what we all knew for so long. And I know that we each of us have our own preferences. But there's actually nothing inherently superior about physical gatherings or online ones. They both have their advantages and disadvantages, depending on the environment. Physical gatherings have a certain energy to them that we can't capture exactly online. Hugs and food and singing are much more possible in person. But on the other hand, Online, people are able to connect from far away. Some folks have joined us who have never set foot in our building or who haven't been able to come in person for years. Online worship allows a wide input of creativity from speakers and musicians and other sources. And we've seen a wellspring of creativity and involvement from folks who might not otherwise have participated in the same way. Adaptation, friends. We're doing it. We're doing it. I'm so, so proud to watch as we, each of us, move in the direction of life. That's what adaptation is. We are protecting each other as best we are able from this virus, while we are also supporting each other, offering care, sharing our joys and concerns, and finding meaning together. I've watched as folks have offered brilliant RE sessions online to the kids. I've witnessed people submitting videos and photos and music that have just made my heart swell. 
I've witnessed during committee meetings as people help each other, troubleshooting Zoom or setting up Google Docs or learning how to record themselves. In short, I've seen this environment challenge us, and I have seen our fellowship and our community adapt in beautiful ways, ways that we wouldn't have needed to or wanted to had this challenge not occurred. But since it did, this community had a choice, adaptation or extinction, and we chose to keep going. Now, many of you have heard me talk about how when I served the Unitarian Universalist congregation in Annapolis, Maryland, prior to coming here to Appleton, one of my proudest accomplishments there was to create a summer day camp for kids. We called it Camp Beagle after the HMS Beagle, the ship that Darwin was aboard when he made his observations that contributed to the theory of evolution by natural selection. Camp Beagle has been around for over 10 years now, and it serves 100 kids each summer, teaching them the wonder and beauty and miracle of evolution. It's my sincere hope that once this pandemic is over, that we will eventually host a Camp Beagle here in Appleton. The poem by Stephen Dunn that we heard earlier was about a parent whose child attended the local Sunday school camp and how he struggled with what she was learning there. Now, I personally find a lot of meaning in Bible stories and in the life of Jesus. So by sharing that poem, I don't mean to suggest that jumping up and down for Jesus is something that our children shouldn't do. By all means, they can do that. But he says in the poem, You can't teach disbelief to a child, only wonderful stories, and we hadn't a story nearly as good. Evolution is magical, he writes, but devoid of heroes. You can't say to your child, evolution loves you. The story stinks of extinction and nothing exciting happens for centuries. Oh, how I wish I could be Stephen Dunn's minister and welcome his daughter into our religious education program. I wish I could help them see the love in evolution. Now, granted, it's not the love that two people have for each other, but it's the larger love encapsulated by a beautiful and miraculous progression of life. That we are not alone at the top of the hierarchy with heroes and vanquished but we are rather nestled, cuddled in a great family tree, surrounded by life. I wish I could help him see that his pessimistic view of extinction and nothing exciting happening is missing the point. I wish I could help him see that the force of adaptation has brought forth the most intricate and incredible diversity of life that none of us not even the most brilliant and creative person on earth would be able to dream up the adaptations in the life forms on this planet. That Darwin's survival of the fittest has been mischaracterized and misused throughout recent history. That the pressure of environmental change gives rise not just to struggle, but to powerful and shockingly beautiful adaptations. That our ability to change individually and collectively is truly a miracle. It's a miracle that we can change and we are. And by doing so, we are moving in the direction of life. May it be so. And amen. Resilience, we are strong. Shoulder to shoulder, we move in our resilience. Make a new plan, 
Stand up again, say yes, we can resilience. We are strong, shoulder to shoulder, keep moving on. Resilience, make a new plan. Stand up again, say yes, we can resilience. We are strong, shoulder to shoulder, keep moving on. Make a new plan, stand up again, say yes, we can resilience. We are strong, shoulder to shoulder, keep moving on resilience. Make a new plan, stand up again, say yes, we can resilience. We are strong. Sharing our individual joys and concerns helps us collectively to flex and to grow, practically, spiritually, and relationally. It can be a risk to share, but one that we hope feels rewarding when you know that we are holding space for and with you while we worship this morning. You might consider typing into the chat box any personal news you wish to share with our gathered community, whether it is large or small, minor or magnificent. If you would like to talk to me, to another minister, or to a member of our care team, please let me know. Connection is available if you would appreciate it. If you'd like to be included in our weekly email, which goes out later today, you can submit your joy or concern via the form on our website or by emailing me or any member of staff. With silence can come a sense of peace, expansion, and even transformation. Let's seek it together now with this shared quiet, and then we will join our voices together. And we believe in life and in the strength of love. And we have found a need to be together. We have our hearts to give. We have our thoughts to receive. And we believe that sharing is an answer. Each week, we take time for generosity, remembering that the acts of giving and receiving are spiritual practices. As always, if you are in need of financial or emotional support, please reach out to any of our ministers, Rev. Christina, Rev. Leah, or Allie, so they can offer help including modest financial support through the minister's discretionary fund. 
For those of you who are feeling relatively more financially secure, we want to thank you for your continuing to give and ask you to keep doing so. There are several ways you can give to the fellowship and many reasons to do so. Here are just a few. Hi, I'm Justin Fisher, and I've been going to the fellowship for about four years. And I have kept going even during the pandemic because I really find the services to be uplifting and um, inspirational in this time of challenge. And I support the fellowship because, I mean, one of one of many reasons is I really feel like I belong in this community. And that's kind of the first time I really felt that way. Um, so it's it's really something that I enjoy and love. As we come to the end of our service, we will extinguish our chalice flame, even as we still hold its light in our hearts. As we extinguish this flame, let us go our ways with hope in our hearts, with our spirits renewed and with a deeper understanding of life's mystery. Let us carry the light of compassion and commitment to build a better world. After our closing words, we will be having small breakout groups, just like usual, for 15 minutes of connection and conversation. In a moment, we will hear a short postlude song. If you do not wish to participate in small group conversations, then please use that postlude music time to log off and leave this Zoom meeting. If you choose to stay, I encourage you to learn each other's names and to pay attention to that timer in the corner of your screen so that everyone gets a chance to share. And with that, go in resilience growing in strength, go in flexibility, changing and bending, go in peace, knowing we embrace each other even now from a distance. <laughs>